More on the retail picture. We're joined by two top economists. Yes, we've got Joseph Brusuelas, is Bloomberg LP's senior economist, and also David Simmons. He is a Bloomberg Best Economist from Standard Chartered Bank. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to have you with us. Joe, I didn't know that you were a top economist at Bloomberg LP. How did you get that title? I don't know. You know, before I came here, though, I was one of Bloomberg's best economists. I know. So it was an easy transference. Uh oh, you may be applying the career path here for, for David. <laughs> Let's find out about the, what the path. The trajectory now for the consumer, because if you dig a little bit deeper into the numbers, David, the numbers today, the retail sales numbers, that was not such a great report because it was about gasoline and it was about automobiles. Take those two things away and we shouldn't be cheering, right? Right, exactly. And also when you take away um, autos, building material and uh, gasoline, those are the things that the uh, government actually strips out when they look at GDP report. So when they're factoring in GDP, you're actually seeing a lower number feeding in from retail sales. And that's unfortunately got to concern people when it looks for the consumer. Now, obviously, we're not seeing a contraction. This time, a couple of years ago, we weren't very optimistic about the outlook, whereas we're looking for the outlook of retail sales to say steady and firm rather than expanding and strong, unfortunately. Joe Busuelos, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And actually, when you look deeper in that report, what you saw was a third, strong, third straight month of strong orders on for building materials, of all things. And when you look at the condition of the housing sector or the housing market, I think one can take a step back and look that that's not likely to continue. So you strip that out, and what you're looking at is really about a 2.5% growth in core retail sales, which really isn't anything to write home about. As a matter of fact, we're looking at this all right now within the context of the upcoming holiday shopping season. Last year, the holiday shopping season increased 2.6%, and the National Federation of Retailers, as Julie pointed out, are only estimating a 2.3% increase. So we're going to be lucky just to get to that, that baseline estimate. Well, indeed, there was a column today by Bloomberg Stocks columnist Dave Wilson that said that there was a report out of Citigroup about the inventory, the unsold inventory of homes is so great that going at the current rate, we'll maybe get through with it by about 2014. David, is that going to be likely, 2014? Well, I think that's only going to be likely if you know, the, the labor market doesn't turn around. Now, you are going to be looking for some improvement in the labor market, but it's really the labor market that is key to the turning around of the housing market. If the labor market came back at a very strong pace, then we would need more inventory because then sales would pick up and the numbers wouldn't look quite so dismal. But unfortunately, you know, we're bouncing along at the bottom at the moment and we're not seeing an improvement in the labor market. So oh. 2012, 2014? At some point in the future. Some point in the future. We've Gentlemen, what do you make of this letter, Joe Brusuelos? Is this really the kind of thing we want people to be doing, bashing the Fed in public? No, <laughs> we do not. We do not want our politicians or our political class bashing the Fed. The Fed needs to remain an independent institution. And while there's legitimate concern, and we should debate what the Fed's doing, and there are some risks to what the Fed's doing, I think our our Republican friends ought to remember that one day. Uh, they will not be in charge of one of the chambers of the legislature and they will want the Fed to remain independent and not want legislate, legislators setting monetary policy, which it looks like at least the pol more politicized members of the letter would actually like to see occur. David Simmons, does this risk a, a, a greater backlash from other central banks? We've already had the German finance minister saying that quantitative easing as practiced by Ben Bernanke and the U.S. Fed is basically a clueless policy. Well, I think it's very hard to say that it's clueless. I think that's actually wrong. I think they know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to get short-term rates down. Now, it's not popular around the world because it is making the dollar fall in value, although obviously it's been picking up against the euro on uh, concerns about Ireland especially. Now, the thing is, you know, the, the Fed is going to do what's best for America. It's not really going to be concerned about external pressure. Ultimately, their focus is on getting growth back in America, and this is what they've seen as, this is basically their last throw of the dice. This is what they have to do. And they came in, and they did more than the market was really looking for, and the market seems almost disappointed either that they haven't done enough or you know, they just don't seem to be able to make up their mind that what they're doing is right. And the thing is the Fed has got a very long-term view, whereas the market's view is incredibly myopic. And that's the problem. You're trying to appease people whose view is very short-term with your long-term actions. Joe Brusuelos, is it possible that the Fed's got it right because so many people hate what they've done? I mean, if you don't offend everybody, you're not doing something wise. You're not doing something wise. It's, it's possible that in the short term they've got it right. But I do think that... Uh, 
doing, engaging in the sort of policies that they've put forward to prevent the sort of the left tail risk of a deflationary What's shock. What's the left tail risk? Well, that's it's the left side of the distribution where you've got uh, very small occurrences that could happen. In this case, it would be deflation or deflationary stock that they've bet these policies will prevent that occurring. But the unintended consequences of this is they've upset our economic partners, strategic allies, and of course, there's the right side of the distribution where you've got the tail is inflationary risk. And I think that's where the investors and the strategists are looking. All right, but what would have happened if they had gone along with all these critics and actually done everything that the Germans, the Chinese, the ECB, sure. Uh, the Indians, the Australians had wanted. What would the U.S. economy look like in six months? I would think that we'd have a much higher rate of unemployment, we'd have a slower rate of growth, and the economy would be heading towards a Japanese-style decade of, of, of uh, stagnation. David, do you agree? Yeah, I do, and so I think it's very hard to get angry with what the Fed has done. I mean, so, what if, is the, so, so what is the psychology behind all the people, you know, rapping on the, on the Fed? I mean, do they, they, they not? Want action now. They want, they, want, well, they want action now and they've got it, but they want results now. And unfortunately, it doesn't work. It sounds work like they want now. a magic wand. They want right. more than just what a Federal Reserve chief does. And I think you have to go back to where we were before the first round of quantitative easing and think, well, if we hadn't taken this action then, where would we be now? And I think unemployment would be more towards the 12% mark. And, you know, we could be in a deflationary depression. So the thing is, it's very hard to model where we would be because obviously we don't know how the path would have played out. But I think we would definitely be in a much worse position and no one can argue that we would be in a better position now had the Fed not acted. Joe Busuelos? Well, I think what the, the real problem is, is we've got a bit of policy incoherence in Washington. A bit? A bit, more than a bit. We're in a liquidity trap, and a liquidity trap screams out for fiscal policy, more aggressive fiscal policy, but because of the outcome of the election, we're not going to get that. So, Mr. so fiscal policy meaning that you want the government to do something, not right. the Federal I mean, Reserve? We would be, we'd have a much more efficient policy if the federal government took steps to address the housing market. The $75 billion HAMP program, the Home Affordability Modification Program, failed miserably. It's unfortunate, but now that we've got this new uh, power shift in Washington, we really aren't going to take any steps. The but Fed you think sees that, I mean, We were just talking off camera that you said that what the government needs to do is figure out a way to make everybody in the housing market whole. That's right. When you've got 25% of homeowners underwater, a full third don't own 10% equity, so they can't take advantage of the historically low interest rates that the Fed's responsible for, you've got a real problem. And until we address that, we're just going to be spinning our wheels in the mud, really. So, David, do you think that we get any kind of results out of Washington? Does someone kind of at one point say, you know what, let's just try it and see what would happen if we actually helped all those homeowners? I mean, I think the main problem is this is going to be politically very unpopular, and getting anyone to agree on this, especially in the short term, just isn't going to happen with regards to the homeowners. I think the key probably will be to come to some sort of agreement with regards to the tax cuts in the near term. I think that's the immediate thing. And also, you've got to be concerned about how the expiration of unemployment benefits is going to be playing out in the near term, because you're going to have between two and two and a half million people running out from their employment benefits in the next three to six months. So that's going to be something that's going something to weigh in on those unemployment to. numbers, Joe Busuelos. That's right. When that unemployment rate moves back above 10 percent next year, uh, people in Washington might be singing a different tune, and perhaps we get a little bit more policy cooperation. Maybe they'll be inviting Ben Bernanke to play tennis, right, and you know, invite him out. Uh, I don't. Somehow, I don't think they're going to be inviting Gentle Ben over to the congressional uh, golf course. We got to leave it there. Thanks very much, Joe Busuelos, David Simmons. Appreciate your insights.